I want to talk today about Kant's categories. The categories in Aristotle are categories of being. They're senses in which a thing may be said to be. The same thing is true in the Vaisheshika Sutra. Kant proposes a system of categories, but it's a rather different system as we'll see, and it's doing something different. These are not categories of being. Instead, these come out of logical functions of judgment. He's looking at logic. And there's something that is fascinating by, uh, in a biographical sense when we look at this, because Kant, in his lectures on logic and in his little book on logic, says logic is a remarkable discipline. It really hasn't changed for the past 2,000 years, and it seems to be a complete subject. Nothing will ever be added to it. Well, modern logic has added a lot to it, so uh, he was writing that just a few decades before there would be a major transformation in logic. But nevertheless, when you look at the logical functions of judgment he outlines and look at the categories, you realize, well, there's all sorts of stuff there that we can now explain something of in logic, but that he couldn't have at all. So even in his own terms, he should have realized, wait, there's a lot more to do in this subject. My own logical functions of judgment include many, many concepts that aren't included in my own logic book. But that's just sort of a comic aside. What is Kant doing with these categories? We've talked about Kant as a rationalist. He was a student of Wolf, who was a student of Leibniz, and he agrees that there are innate ideas and that there is synthetic a priori knowledge. The innate ideas he refers to as the pure concepts of the understanding. Those are the categories. But there are also synthetic a priori truths. He calls them laws of the understanding. And so what I want to talk about today is that duo, basically. The categories, the pure concepts of the understanding, so we'll see what Kant thinks are the innate ideas, and also what he takes these synthetic a priori truths to be, the laws of the understanding. It is important to recognize that unlike other rationalists, Kant thinks these apply only within the realm of experience. Descartes and Leibniz thought they were true about the world, and so we're happy to apply them within experience and outside of experience, even to things we cannot experience. But Kant says no. <laughs> They're really part of the way in which our mind constructs experience. And so they apply only to the output of that process, not to whatever input might be present or to whatever might be in the world beyond the realm of our experience. He gives us, as we've seen, a transcendental argument. He says the a priori concepts and the laws of the understanding are necessary conditions for the possibility of experience. But we do have experience, so of course it's possible. So there must be a priori concepts. There must be laws of the understanding. So in short, for us to experience the world at all, we have to have some innate ideas, these a priori concepts of the understanding or the categories. We also have to have synthetic a priori knowledge through the laws of the understanding. But that raises the question, what are the necessary conditions for the possibility of experience? What in particular do I need? What are these pure concepts of the understanding? What concepts do I need, Kant? What principles must I assume as synthetic a priori principles in order to have experience be possible? Good questions, and he does answer them. Let's think about some experiences. I have visual experiences like this of the University of Texas Tower or this of the White House, or a field of flowers, or a sunset, or my cat Belle, or a pizza, or another pizza. I'm fond of pizza. <laughs> well, what makes all of these things possible? Notice some of these are visual experiences. That's how you've seen them. But I can tell you with the pizzas, um, it wasn't just visual. There was a wonderful smell, a wonderful taste, and so forth. So we experience the world through our five senses in all sorts of ways. What makes that kind of experience possible? Well, the first thing Kant says, turning to sensibility now, he draws a sharp line between sensibility and understanding. In short, between perception and reason, whatever our minds do on the basis of our experience, how we process and then draw inferences from our perceptions. But let's turn first to sensibility, just for us to have those sensations, to be able to experience the White House or sunsets or pizza. Well, those things have to be represented in space and time. So space and time, he says, are a priori forms of sensibility. 
Vision obviously represents things as being in space. Hearing does too, maybe less obviously. Nevertheless, if you close your eyes and somebody around you is making noise, you can tell where the noise is coming from. Your auditory system does represent things as being in space and time. Now smell, taste, well, not so much. But on the other hand, they still occur in time. You anticipate the taste of the pizza. You actually enjoy the taste. Afterwards, you remember the taste. And so that occurs in time. We perceive things as being in space and time. So here's something we can say, and we can say it a priori, independently of experience. Perceptible objects exist in space and time. That is a synthetic a priori truth. It is based on the general form of sensibility, the form of sensibility as representing things in space and time. I've referred to the metaphor in another video of a projector. Kant sees the mind as something like a projector, projecting an image on a screen. We can know something about what's going to be on the screen and what couldn't be on the screen on the basis of understanding the projector. So he thinks, here's one thing I can tell you about the projector, just due to the nature of our own faculty of sensibility and the way our mind processes whatever it receives, things are perceived in space and time. Things on that screen will have a spatial arrangement and they will occur in a temporal series. I can tell you that before anything appears on that screen. So that's something I can know that's synthetic. It's really about the things on the screen. It's not just something purely logical or verbal like a screen is a screen. What appears will appear. <laughs> I mean, it's not like that, right? It's something that gives you real information. It will be in space. It will be in time. And I can know that not because I actually perceive them in space and time and I say, oh, I'm figuring out, you know, I, I perceive things. I guess these things I perceive are in space and time. Who, who knew? <laughs> He'll say, no, I, I could really know that a priori. I know that just by knowing something about the way my mind processes information. Now, the categories are the part that pertains to the understanding. Space and time are forms of sensibility. But they're also forms of understanding, things my mind does with the information it receives from sensation. So sensibility gives the mind information. And then he says a complex synthesis takes place. A synthesis of the manifold of intuition is how he puts it. And we construct objects out of that in, broadly speaking, a three-stage process. I won't go through all the stages here. What I'm interested in today is this question of the categories. What pure concepts of the understanding are required in order for those stages of synthesis to take place? He says, well, we can find out by looking at the logical functions of judgment. The traditional rationalists had thought about universality and necessity. And indeed, Kant says, universality and necessity are absolutely fundamental for understanding why we need synthetic a priori truths and why we need pure concepts of the understanding. But if we want to know what those pure concepts are, they aren't just two, universality and necessity. It's more complicated than that. We look to the functions of judgment in logic. And we say, what is going on in a logical judgment? Kant says there are basically four things going on. And so there are four families of categories. The first thing that goes on in a judgment is quantity. Okay? We talk about things like Socrates was a philosopher. We talk about sometimes groups of things. Some ancient Greeks were prominent philosophers. We talk sometimes about a totality. Here's where the universality comes in. All forces applied to a mass accelerate that mass. And so those are basic categories, things that today in logic we'd refer to as quantifiers or as determiners. So things like some, all, several, every, any, these things function as indicators of quantity. They are part of the logical functions of judgment. And the same thing is true about objects. One, unity, plurality, telling the difference between one and more than one, as well as, well, demonstratives, things like this, that, in effect, this one, that one, the. All of those are things that fall under this general category of quality. So those are words that indicate these general categories. We have ways of talking about objects, of telling one from more than one, of talking about some things, several things, all, every, each thing, anything. All of those are categories. Those have to be built into the mind. Those aren't things we get from experience. You can say, well, I've learned about pigs by having encounters with pigs and 
and you know, working on a pig farm and so forth. How did you learn about this? Well, this what? No, I just mean the word this. <laughs> How did you learn what each meant? How did you learn several? How did you learn to distinguish one thing from more than one thing? person's going to be like, well, do you mean how I learned the meaning of the word? No, no, no. I don't mean that. I mean how you ever got the concept of one as opposed to more than one. Well, <laughs> can't point to an experience of that and Kant's saying, yes, the mind came with that. Okay, That was part of the building structure of the mind. The mind is capable of combining things into objects, distinguishing one object from multiple objects, is capable of actually then explaining something about these pluralities of objects and talking about one, some, several, and so forth. And so all of those come as built-in structures. We aren't gaining those logical meanings from experience. We aren't understanding those logical concepts from experience. The logical concepts are part of the structure of the mind. Here's a second thing that goes on in judgments. We judge quality. So we affirm things, we deny things and we express some limitations. So Kant says, yes, we say Socrates is a philosopher. Or somebody can say, um, was Socrates the teacher of Plato? Yes, that's true. Those things are actually affirming something. We can also say Socrates was not a plumber, <laughs> and that Socrates was not the teacher of Aristotle. We can say then the claim that Socrates lived after Aristotle is false. So we can also deny things. So our ideas of is and is not, true and false, yes and no, these are things that are, again, built into the mind. This, that, <laughs> we don't learn those things through experience. We may learn the gesture, we may learn the words, but we don't learn the concepts from experience. The mind comes with those built in. And the same thing he says is true with limitation. Something like unhappy or ahistorical uh, or inauthentic. You might think, well, those are just denials. But Kant thinks, not really. Okay? Say I talk to somebody, I say, well, how are, you, how are you feeling today? You feeling happy? They say, well, I don't know. You're unhappy? Well, I don't know. <laughs> okay? There, there's sort of a, yeah, sometimes we'll say, well, I'm not unhappy. Right? Is not unhappy the same as happy? Not really. Okay? And that's what Kant's picking up on here. He's saying, yeah, yeah, is that authentic? Well, it's not inauthentic. <laughs> uh, that's not simply an affirmation that it is authentic. Or, you know, if I refer to that as ahistorical, does that just mean it is not historical? Well, maybe, but sometimes it really means, no, it goes contrary to the history. And so anyway, I can easily, in fact, you might say most of us spend many hours of our lives in states that are neither happy nor unhappy. Um, and so all of those things are built into the mind at the outset. Well, another category is the category of relation. And there are all sorts of interesting and important relations, Kant says. Some of them involve inherence and subsistence. You might remember this from the categories of the Vaisheshika tradition as they develop beyond the original three in the Vaisheshika Sutra. So we've got is, the is of predication, like this is a hand. We've got substance, quality, property, exemplifies, participates in, has, instantiates, for example, for instance, such as. All of those refer to concepts that we're not gaining from experience. The relation of this triangle to triangularity, we don't get that from experience. That's something the mind is built understanding. That is built into the structure of the mind. Identifying things as objects, having the concept of substance, of those qualities hanging together in something. Notice these are just the things that empiricists like Barclay and Hume said, I don't see how you can get any of this from experience. Kant says, of course you can't. <laughs> they come built into the mind. They don't come from experience. But of course we have these concepts. Don't tell me we don't have the concept is, that we don't have the concept of a substance or a quality or a property or of this participating in triangularity or exhibiting triangularity, or this being an example of this more general phenomenon. Of course we have those concepts. So, and it's not just some internal custom of the mind, it's something that the mind has built into it as its structure. Now actually, there is a sense in which Kant's saying, well, it is a custom of the mind, you're right about that, Hume. But it's the structure of logic that is built into the mind. 
That's not some feeling or sentiment. It's not outside of reason. It is the very foundation of reason. The same thing is true with causality and dependence. If-then relations, cause, effect, because, depends, determines, grounds, all of those involve various aspects of this relation of causality or dependence. And then there are relations of community, of things being interdependent, reciprocity, if and only if, and, or, unless, part, whole, with. Tons of these things happen in language, and they all refer to these relations of community. The mind is built in such a way that it understands things as sometimes interrelated in various ways. It doesn't have to learn that. Now, it might have to learn a particular way in which things are interrelated, but the idea that things can be related to one another in this way, the mind doesn't have to learn that. It comes built in recognizing that. Then finally, there are modal aspects of a judgment. So, we can talk about possibility, necessity, existence, non-existence. He says there are three basic dichotomies here. Possibility and impossibility, so words like possible, can, may, might, could, and the concepts they stand for. Existence and non-existence, so is, exists, will, and so forth. Necessity and contingency, necessary, must, needs to, has to, would, all of those involve some kind of modality. And he says those are important. Those are built into the structure of the mind. Hume's right. We don't get necessity from experience. We don't get causation from experience. We don't get possibility from experience. But they're crucial parts of logic. They are part of the foundations of reason. So don't tell me we have no such concepts, or that they're outside the realm of reason, or that they're just emotions and feelings of expectation. Nonsense. They are part of the logical functions of judgment. They're built into logic, the very foundation of reason. Well, when we think about advances in logic since Kant's day, we can say maybe modern logicians should recognize a variety of other categories still within his basic families of categories. Under the heading of quantity, there are lots of other words and concepts that go along in addition to the ones he mentioned, so many, few, most, more, less, finitely many, infinitely many, countably many, uncountably many. Um, and then what I've marked here is a little null symbol. In other words, I mean whatever we, say, what we mean when we talk about things in terms of bare plurals. Tigers are striped, for example. Lions are tawny. Cats meow. Birds fly. Whatever's going on there, presumably that's a kind of quantity or kind of something that is built into the mind. They're qualities. And not only the things he mentions, but also things involving temporal relations. They arise through sensibility, but we also have built-in concepts for understanding things as arranged in time. So verb tenses, for example, or various indicators of aspects, like the difference between runs and is running and used to run. And then prepositions like before, after, since, until, now, then. All of those are temporal things that seem to be built into the mind. Similarly, there are other relations, like equality or similarity, like, near, far, closer than, between, belongs to, and then maybe other modalities, ones he doesn't directly talk about, but like may, should, and ought, things that, again, Hume worries can't be derived from experience, and Kant would say, yeah, they're built into the nature of the mind. But also things like generally, typically, normally, maybe other things like knowing, believing, seeing, fearing, wanting, Maybe all of those are built into the mind as well. Whatever we want to say exactly about the boundaries there, we should be able to say, okay, things like that are presumably maybe part of this idea of the pure concepts of the understanding as well. They relate to the pure concepts in the sense that they relate to logical functions of judgment. Well, what kinds of principles of the understanding do we build out of these pure concepts of the understanding? Here are some examples Kant gives. Every object stands under the necessary conditions of the synthetic unity of the manifold of intuition in a possible experience. Let me translate from the Kantian language. He says every object of experience is in effect something that would be displayed on that screen we've talked about. I can know that all the objects have to conform to the conditions of being on that screen. So they all have to conform to space and time. They all have to conform to the logical functions of judgment. And so they have to be one or many. <laughs> they have to either be related to one another or not. They have to be in a relation of dependence or not. 
They have to have some modal character. Either they are there now or they could be there. They were there. They will be there. We can say something about all those structures before they even appear. They are subject to the conditions of the synthesis of the unity of the manifold. In other words, the way in which projector forms objects and projects them onto the screen of experience. Secondly, in all change of appearances, substance is permanent. Its quantum in nature is neither increased nor diminished. A kind of law of conservation of substance, conservation of matter. Well, after Einstein, we're inclined to think, hmm, I don't know about that, that would cause. But of course, physics still maintains a law of the conservation of energy. And when you think about this one, you can say, well, Kant is on to something interesting here. What he's saying is that substance is that in which qualities inhere. And so whatever you want to say about that, whatever it is the qualities inhere in, maybe in modern physics we want to say, well, it's not exactly substance, it's energy or it's waves or something. I mean, whatever physical theory ends up saying about that, maybe it'll be a string in hyperspace, who knows. But whatever it is, we could say that remains the same. Its qualities change. But in the end, we postulate that something is enduring across these changes of quality. So that idea that something endures across change, whether we call it substance or something else, he says is a basic feature of the mind. Third, all alterations, all changes take place in conformity with the law of the connection of cause and effect. In other words, things just don't happen randomly and spontaneously. Things cause other things. Things that happen are effects of other things. So cause and effect applies to the world. We can know that because we can know something about the projector and knows that it projects things as causally related to one another. And finally, we know that it also projects them as interrelated with one another. All substances, insofar as they can be perceived to coexist in space, are in thoroughgoing reciprocity. So we know that the projector is such that the objects of experience are represented as together there in space and time, as in some sense together there under the logical functions of judgment. So the, it, in effect he's saying, look here, it's built into the mind that we're seeing things on one screen, that we're building one universe, one universe of experience. It's not as if we're experiencing some multiverse and different things are going on and there are these different realms of objects that are simply completely unrelated. The mind is projecting things on all sorts of different screens at once. No, there is one screen of experience, he's saying, and everything is in some way on that screen, related to the same logical functions, related to one another, on the same screen in the same spatio-temporal manifold. So out of that, he says, we do get some synthetic a priori judgments. Things like physical objects are in space and time. Mathematics, he thinks, follows from this. The world consists of objects having properties, standing in relation to one another. Substances persist through change. Every event has a cause. Everything relates in some way to everything else. Those, he thinks, we can know independently of experience. But they apply only to the phenomena, only to the things as we perceive them only to the objects of experience. The categories apply to those. The a priori principles apply to those. We can know them with universality and necessity because they fall under the pure concepts of the understanding. But the noumena, the things in themselves, the categories don't apply to them. The a priori principles don't apply to them. We don't know about them at all. So, Kant says, think about our diagram over here. Think about this picture of the mind projecting the objects of experience. We can know things about those because in the projection, the mind is representing them as being in space and time. The mind is representing them as being susceptible to the logical forms of judgment. And so the categories apply to them. We can say this is one triangle. We can talk about it as an object. We can do a variety of other things indicating what must be true of it. And all of that indicates that those principles, those a priori principles, the laws of the understanding, apply here. But now if we move down to the realm of things in themselves, the realm he refers to as the noumena, the noumenal realm, then we say, uh, <laughs> we can't say anything about those at all. They are outside of what is on that screen of experience. And so our concepts aren't applying to them, those pure concepts of the understanding, those laws of the understanding don't apply to them. I can't say they have a certain character because the things projected on the screen do. 
I don't know what they're like. And so in the end, he says, I can know things a priori. I can know things a priori about the objects of experience precisely because my mind is taking information, synthesizing it in a multi-stage process, and producing these objects of experience. And so I can know something about what they're going to be like. I have no idea what the world beyond them is like.